We're now across to our Cape Town studios for our weekly strategy session with Anil Jagmohan. He's the investment analyst over at Ned Group Investments. Thanks so much, Anil, for joining us uh, this afternoon. Well, talking to yes, market watchers at the desk, consensus seems to be that investment decisions are being made a little too, mad, uh, too emotionally right now, that investors need to start taking the emotion out of the equation. Are things becoming too emotional in your books? Yeah, look, I mean, definitely today is the perfect example where it's been a particularly bad day in the market. And just in our experience, what we find is that investors in particular really struggle to make decisions either with their heart and their brain at the same time. <laughs> so it's usually, you know, one of the two that tends to, to overpower the other. And what we find is that, you know, when you start making decisions with your heart, um, the objectivity, you know, which comes as a result of using your brain, actually tends to suffer quite significantly. Of course, uh, those are the factors you take into account when approaching any relationship. So that's why important. Let's take a look at making decisions. I mean, in sifting through your short-term and long-term ambitions, that's got to be a key priority right now in terms of what your goal is and whether you're investing for the short-term or the long-term, right? Absolutely. So definitely, while there is definitely value to be added to making shorter-term decisions, our philosophy definitely centers more around the longer term, where we take a bigger picture view and we try to avoid making decisions based on shorter term movements and shorter term news flow, which potentially can affect your decisions quite negatively over the long term. How do you resist that herd mentality, though? I mean, what are some of the steps that investors should be following to ensure that they act rationally when investing in very volatile markets? Sure, absolutely. So, so definitely we always advocate chatting to a professional first to make sure that you completely understand the characteristics of the asset classes that you invest in. Now, very often what we find with investors, and we tend to have quite a large retail focus, is that people tend not to fully understand equities, for example. So when there's like a significant drop of, let's say, maybe 10, 20, 30 percent, people are actually quite surprised you know, by this outcome, not realizing that, in fact, if you study market return history, you actually see that this is quite, quite a normal incidence of market movements, although it doesn't happen that often, but definitely is quite possible. With that being uh, you know, your approach or your view on the markets right now and you know, how you should be approaching it, is it safe to say that you're not adjusting your portfolio or investments in any big way right now? Absolutely. So, so definitely we could foresee this for quite a long time now because I mean, essentially we do manage research and selection and we tend to keep quite a close um, contact with a lot of the managers that we use. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them have been saying that, in fact, for example, the U.S. should have been downgraded a long time ago. So, and that's just one example of, you know, the critical issues that's happening around the world at the moment. I mean, the euro is an issue, China's an issue. And essentially what we're seeing is that for a long time, a lot of our managers have been focusing on those high quality companies, you know, managed by very good quality management personnel. And definitely we think that for the longer term, you know, that's where we've been positioned for the last few months, and that's definitely the way going forward as well. Before we get to things on a company basis, just taking a look at your portfolio and your exposure, your positioning over there in terms of asset classes, how, how, how is that looking at this stage? Absolutely. So we've definitely seen the RAND as being very strong, and over the last couple of months that you know, certainly has turned around a little bit, but um, at levels of around 650 is when we went quite um, relatively overweight in terms of offshore. And a lot of managers, of our managers, have been finding that the opportunities in the offshore high quality, the larger cap companies, are definitely looking a lot more, um, a lot more better than what they're finding in the local market. Mm -hmm. With that offshore exposure, though, there's, uh, you know, the, uh, the view has been that you've got to have a bias more to those companies that have an emerging market footprint. So is that also a premise on which those investments get made in your books? Absolutely. So definitely a key cornerstone of our philosophy is to make sure that the price you pay is obviously as low as possible. I mean, even Warren Buffett says so, that the price you pay is like the major determinant of your return going forward. So often what you find is that even though emerging markets tend to have higher growth rates, so automatically people might think that, okay, if you're investing with the global companies that have quite a large emerging market footprint, automatically you'll do well. Unfortunately, the problem is that if you pay too high a price for those companies, then you're unfortunately not going to make such great returns going forward. So what we have to do in our job of analysts, as analysts are you know, not particularly easy, but we have to find those companies offering you know, good potential future returns at a very good price at the moment. So give us a typical example of a company offshore that presents good value and investment merit right now. 
Yeah, so I'm not as close to, to the individual companies, but I can tell you that companies like Johnson & Johnson, mm -hmm. Coca-Cola, and Dell, you know, where there's really top class management and, you know, very strong products, and they really, you know, have a strong um, market share, you know, in the industries that they play in. Definitely, those are some of the companies that we think to be quite good value at the moment. Of course, all of those that you've mentioned have that strong, uh, fast-moving consumer good focus uh, specifically. Is that uh, a theme that translates when you're looking at South African companies? So um, what we definitely try to do is to make sure we are focusing on the big, bigger picture. So it doesn't matter whether it is consumer goods or you know, whatever industry it is in, but we try to make sure that the cash flows that we expect to receive going forward adequately compensate for the, for the price that we're going to be paying right now. Uh, let's take a look at some of those that show good value locally right here in South Africa. Resources have been standing out as a case in point. I mean, we've got uh, Anglo-American trading at a PE of 7, where historically that PE has stood at 14. So half of its historical PE. Exaro as well on a forward PE of 8.8. .8, and many citing those as prime examples of, uh, you know, players that offer value right now. Yeah, so for us, I mean, definitely while we do consider P-E ratios, we do have to be careful in that, you know, there are two components, which is the price and the earnings. And you have to make sure that you do a proper analysis of the earnings as they are right now, because that could quite severely distort the P-E ratio, you know, in itself. Mm -hmm. uh, let's take a look at that demand scenario, though, Anil. I mean, in terms of all that's going on in the global economic uh, landscape, how are you assessing that scenario and the ability to offer uh, resources to further benefit of uh, rising commodity prices and uh, possible sustainability of those commodity prices moving forward? Yeah, look, so as you mentioned, a lot of it does really depend on demand and supply. And you are getting, like China, for example, you know, where they purposefully trying to slow down the economy, whereas for a long time, you know, they've been quite a key buyer you know, of these commodity stocks, uh, sorry, commodities themselves, which has subsequently been you know, quite a strong tailwind for commodity companies. So going forward, I mean, I guess you, you would have to do quite a number of forecasts, and potentially mm -hmm. our philosophy is very much more focusing on the valuations right now. 